Hello guys, um, a belated video here on Champions of Champions Boxing Talk. Hope you enjoyed the fights this weekend. Absolutely unreal, isn't it? I mean, I believe at the start of the year and the end of last year, Canelo Alvarez was walking around terrified from a particular middleweight. And we all know who that is. Well, the stakes have just been raised. We've had David Lemieux win spectacularly v. Stevens. Now look at Daniel Jacobs. Let me just say that if Canelo Alvarez is ever going to hear this video, that lineal title is on borrowed time, I think. I actually think style-wise, Danny Jacobs is worse for you than Golovkin. I think you're better off biting the bullet, pal, and fighting Triple G, because some of these guys, you know, they're dangerous too, and I include David Lemieux there, as I've said before. On to the fights. Well, I'll start with the main event. I predicted uh, Gennady Golovkin to stop Danny Jacobs within six rounds. He knocked him down within four the first three rounds, I don't think there was a lot going on, but the UK broadcast, Box Nation, seemed to be giving Danny Jacobs a round if he flicked a wrist. You know, I'm not saying Golovkin was dominating it, but I'm saying you could see those three rounds either way. So if, say, you gave the first three 2-1 Jacobs, 2-1 Golovkin, then you're entitled to do that. It was that close. But no one was dominant in those first three rounds. Before I carry on with the events of the fight, the way in the night before, Danny Jacobs to me looked, well, a little drained and Golovkin looked rehydrated, strong and ready. Fast forward to fight night. And Danny Jacobs got in that ring. And I don't know if it's my imagination or not. But he looked huge. Rehydrated. Healthy. Kind of reminds me of what Canelo Alvarez did with Amir Khan. You know, he looked a bit drawn. And then when him and Amir Khan entered the ring. Canelo Alvarez looked like the Incredible Hulk. Well, Danny Jacobs to me looked like the Incredible Hulk. And a cross between Anthony Joshua and Kovalev. Shout out to Bossman and Benji's Boxing for bringing this up. But I didn't actually realise at the time that um, there was an issue with the IBF title to do with Jacobs weighing. Now, as far as I know, you can only gain £10 after the initial weighing. Now, I think this subject is important because this is happening time and time again in boxing. It seemed like a strategy to me that Jacobs accepted, well, I'll fail the IBF weighing so I can gain even more weight to absorb Golovkin's punches. And it told. I was wondering where Jacobs' chin was coming from. When Golovkin nailed him in the fourth round and he hit him in other parts of the fight with power shots they were kind of bouncing off Jacob's head now when you're caught up in the moment you kind of locked into this story aren't you of he's defeated the odds Danny Jacobs and credit to him he's, I must say this technically and talent wise he's a much better fighter than I ever thought his ability to switch from orthodox southpaw fast hands Good power, went to the body a few times, good lateral movement, good back foot game, not making as many mistakes as I've seen him in recent years. Maybe you do up your game when you're facing a guy like Golovkin, so, but his tactics, I thought, were the key to giving him a good performance in this fight. But again, I'm really... Wait... Classes exist for a reason. And I'm hearing stories that Danny Jacobs entered the ring at £180. 
and that he gained a lot more than the IBF £170 limit. So he couldn't have won the IBF title because of that issue anyway. So he threw that belt away at the chance that him going in there, like I say, like the Incredible Hulk would be able to defeat Golovkin. I'm going to say something. Maybe that came across. Maybe the judges got wind of this because as I say it's is it really right that fighters are doing this Triple G did apparently do the IBF weighing and he weighed no more than 170 pounds I think it was lighter so Jacobs is going in there with a weight class above Golovkin which kind of ruins the story of this fight for me because it looked triumphant. It looked like, you know, a floundering middleweight division where there was only one ruler and everybody was calling the rest of them bums and he was walking through everybody and people were saying, well, you can't say he's like Marvin Hagler because who has he fought? Well, we've seen David Lemieux's spectacular. He's a much better fighter than the media give him credit for. And I thought we've got another one, if not better, here in Danny Jacobs. Some people at the end of the night actually believe Jacobs won the fight. So I thought, we're in business. And then you hear this stuff about the weight. And again, it does remind you of what Canelo Alvarez does, doesn't it? How did I score the fight? Well, the first three rounds, I went Golovkin... Two rounds to one. I gave Golovkin obviously the fourth round. That was like a 10 8. But I thought in the middle rounds, Jacob's skill, his hand speed and precision was sort of confusing Golovkin. Um, and his physical strength, you know, when they clinched. But that's to do with weight as well, isn't it? And again, the punch resistance. The, the guy had a Shane Mosley chin. And I know Danny Jacobs. This is no... I've never known Danny Jacobs with a, with a chin like that before. Lesser punches have really hurt Danny Jacobs than Triple G. So, the last two rounds, I'm thinking, Danny Jacobs is a point ahead here. The 11th round, I thought Golovkin edged it. The 12th, I was wondering what Danny Jacobs was doing. He kind of reminded me of what Juan Manuel Marquez did in his third fight with Manny Pacquiao. You know, trying to see it out, believing that um, all he had to do was survive. But Golovkin outworked him in that round. So in the end, I had it marginally to Golovkin. The punch stats, I thought that the punch stats would be razor close, but actually, Golovkin has significantly outlanded Jacobs in terms of shots landed. Now, I know what people are going to say. Danny Jacobs landed more power shots, and Golovkin landed some power shots, but more jabs. But Golovkin's jabs are not like Floyd Mayweather's jabs. They are essentially power punches, aren't they? I've always said that a power punch is worth more than a jab. But there are different kinds of jabs. And Golovkin's is a very hurtful jab. So the punch stats did favour Golovkin. And in the round for round shots landed, Golovkin seems to have landed more. Now, I don't usually go off CompuBox, but in a fight this close, I had to refer to it after. And if you'd have give it Danny Jacobs, I wouldn't say it was a robbery. I wouldn't say you'd have robbed Golovkin. But I'm hearing a lot of things online saying this is the worst robbery since Timothy Bradley, Manny Pacquiao. Or it was a CJ Ross Floyd Mayweather, Canelo Alvarez situation. No, it wasn't. See, what happens in life sometimes when an underdog goes in the ring and is expected to be blasted out there and isn't, perce perceptions kick in of, of what we are as human beings and we start giving them much more credit than probably what is actually occurring. Now, Jacobs could have won it. It was one of those fights. 
but he didn't win it by a landslide. Golovkin didn't win it by a landslide. So, just bear that in mind when you're scoring fights. One thing I was disappointed with, where was Golovkin's body game? I, I couldn't really see much body work he was doing. I think he'd gone to the body in that fight when they were up close. He'd have slowed a lot of Jacob's movement down. But he needed to be high volume in this fight, in my opinion. But he wasn't. He was always kind of looking for the perfect shot. And... The shots were effective if he was, land if he was landing, but I also think he kind of respected Danny Jacobs too much early on. And as the fight wore on, he kind of thought, well, this is typical, you know, I could take his shots. And he kind of went more for the jugular, but it was kind of like he, you know, hesitated too much. And... In the corner, there didn't seem to be no urgency, which makes me think, think, is Golovkin running this whole show, you know? Abel Sanchez really wasn't putting any, you know, fire under his belly like Teddy Atlas did, you know, with Timothy Bradley. So, it wasn't Golovkin's best performance, but is that, is that because of Golovkin at age nearly 35 now? Or is it? Because of Danny Jacob coming in the ring way over the limit. Or is it the fact that Danny Jacobs is a much better fighter than we all anticipated? I think it's a combination of all them things. A lot of people are saying Golovkin is having some of these performances where he's not like in the Kell Brook fight. And this fight, where he's not looked his absolute best, he's doing it on purpose to draw Canelo Alvarez into battle. I don't actually believe that. Because Kel Brook and Danny Jacobs are world-class fighters. They will hit people if given the opportunity. No question about it. In the fight. I felt Jacobs was more hurt than Golovkin. I don't think there was many marks. On Golovkin's face. The CompuBox numbers favoured Triple G. Triple G also landed a knockdown. So therefore. It's kind of hard to. Give the fight to the other guy as much as you might want to, because he does come across as a create, you know, a courageous soul. Danny Jacobs, the guy's beat cancer, you know, he's come back and he he seemed better than ever. He seemed like an honest human being, a warrior. Then you hear about all this weight stuff, which kind of, well. It, took the shine of the performance see I was excited you know we're alive some people are absolutely annoyed because their prediction didn't come off i.e. Golovkin didn't win in six rounds but sometimes I'm glad when I get it wrong because it opens new horizons you know Hearns, Hagler, Leonard and all them guys <sighs> When you've got competition, I don't think it makes a superstar look weaker. It makes them look greater when they can overcome great odds against great fighters. Right? Now, we're on the bandwagon before of saying that Triple G is the greatest fighter since Sugar Ray Robinson and Muhammad Ali. And in fact, you could put those two guys put together... And it still wouldn't come up as great as Triple G. Well, we're going the other way now. I'm, I'm hearing people online saying he's the most overrated fighter God ever created. Uh, let's put things into perspective. The dotted line in the Canelo fight has not been signed for a reason. Hagler... Struck. Sugar Ray Leonard, Marvin Hagler and people like that struggled with guys smaller than them. Sugar Ray Leonard lost to a smaller guy in Roberto Duran. Triple G has not lost to anyone smaller than him. 
Does that make Sugar Ray Leonard overrated because he lost to Roberto Duran, the smaller man? You have to think about these things when you use terms like exposed and overrated. So no, I don't think Triple G is overrated. But I think he's human. And I always thought he was human. And boxing is a strange sport. Do I think that Danny Jacobs, if he'd have got this decision, it would have been wrong? As I said, no. Because the truth of the matter is... Danny Jacobs shown more, in my opinion, in that fight and will show more after the fight. It, well, it, it's not like Douglas Mike Tyson. Buster Douglas had that sensation for that night. But there wasn't anything sensational really after. But I think Danny Jacobs at age 30 can go on from here and have a great career in the middleweight division. So, there's a possibility of a rematch. And probably the rematch will be huge. You know, Golovkin maybe now has found a rival. Which is a good thing. Wasn't it great with Pacquiao when he discovered Marquez? You know, and these guys went back and forth and had great fights and fan-friendly fights. And were each other's kryptonite. I think it's a good, healthy thing, to be honest with you. It does make me worry, though, watching Danny Jacobs give Golovkin a good match up there, more than his money's worth, about Anthony Joshua now v Klitschko. You know, when Golovkin has faced some good opponents, Anthony Joshua really hasn't fought any. This is the first time he's fighting anyone that's a hint of elite or world class. So, we'll see how all these things play out but I had it marginally for Golovkin but if you give it Jacobs I wouldn't I wouldn't say you'd sinned or you were a fraud or anything like that Um, but as I say Canelo Alvarez he thought he was avoiding one guy now he's avoiding three troubling times ahead for his lineal middleweight title. Moving on to uh, Chocolito, I've uh, Gonzalez to me. I struggle to perceive him as the best pound for pound fighter in the world. I do. I believe Lomachenko is a better all round fighter. I think Warriors can top the pound-for-pound list. But it's Warriors with diversity. Like, it wasn't the same Manny Pacquiao that fought Eric Morales in the lighter weight classes as the Manny Pacquiao that beat Margarito. You know, combinations, movement around the ring, not letting Margarito hit him, using his reflexes and speed to be evasive against the bigger man. You know, he altered his game plan. But Roman Gonzalez is going up in weights and he's doing the same things as he did in his the lower weight classes. Slug, 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 slug. And he's great at it. He's exciting. Great combinations. But he hasn't got the strength or the power now. You know, he's found... Where his limit lies. The skill set of Terence Crawford to me is greater. All round. Than Roman Gonzalez. The skill set still possibly of Manny Pacquiao is. You know. All this can he. And it just shows. What does really unbeaten mean. It doesn't. It's about skill set. Who you face. How you handle it. How you adapt. How you're able to go up the weight classes. And how your body adjusts. See, everybody is obsessed these days with going up in weight in boxing. They have two two fights, two defences of a world title that they've just won. And then the next minute they go up two weight classes. Now, Henry Armstrong... 
Oscar De La Hoya, Manny Pacquiao, they're unique fighters. You don't get many of them. But most times, weight classes are there for a reason. So, there's nothing wrong with unifying and being dominant in your own division, in my opinion. Don't try and go up eight or nine weight classes like Manny Pacquiao because you are not him. Don't try and go up six weight classes like Oscar De La Hoya because you're not him. You don't, you're a different human being. Not every boxer is capable of that. Doesn't mean they ain't great in their own way, but it is what it is. Everybody is special, but special at different things. You can't suddenly become Manny Pacquiao in your head because you want to be him doesn't work that way the fight itself well could have gone either way couldn't it Roman Gonzalez's fight I personally had it even the punch stats favour Gonzalez but the effect and the strength of his opponent that night seemed to nullify that somewhat he did seem the weaker guy in the ring his punches have not his punching power has not carried up. Maybe now it's time for Roman Gonzalez to go down a weight class. Again, very similar to Triple G though. He had that guy hurt, I think it was in the fifth or sixth round, with a body shot, which he never followed up. Why? Why? I mean, he's got the hand speed to do it, Roman Gonzalez. But it was a night for head hunting in terms of the two main attractions on the card I felt that when Triple G I think it was in the 6th or 7th round landed a, a body shot to Danny Jacobs and Jacobs slowed for a second but again he didn't follow it up Jacobs did some good body work in there I thought but Triple G looking for the perfect punch Roman Gonzalez looking for the per perfect combination to the head it didn't make sense. Not when you'd had some success to the body and you don't follow it up. I always thought that a fighter can tell when another fighter is wounded. Maybe they didn't sense that. Maybe they didn't see what I saw. Max Kellerman saying things as well like, well, you got the decision to Roman Gonzalez's opponent was a little bit out of order. Roman Gonzalez was not robbed, Max. Let's not go there. So, that's that really, isn't it? But extraordinary, I mean, we could basically have been on a roll of upsets here. This now makes me rethink the Chavez-Canelo fight, you know. It makes me rethink a little bit. Canelo-Triple G, I still think Triple G wins. But I think Jacobs beats Canelo easier. You know, he's a Lara with strength, size, power, chin now. You know? So you've got Tony Bellew beats David Hay. Nobody saw that coming. You've got the pound for pound king loses. Against his mandatory. And then. Depending on how you score it. The Jacobs Triple G fight. Could have gone either way. When Triple G was a huge favourite. So. Is this the year of the upset? Is Chavez going to throw a spanner in the works? Could we end up with. Jacobs Canelo. Chavez Triple G. Food for thought, but from now on, Triple G, you better watch those guys on the scales. You're the A-side. Would Floyd Mayweather have let that happen? He'd have made sure the other guy comes in at no more than 175, or 70, sorry. And you know something, in this instant, Floyd's right, isn't he? You've got to take control, otherwise some of these guys will be going in against you, Triple G, the size of Anthony Joshua. But upsets are good for boxing. Rivalries are good for boxing. Surprises to predictions are good for boxing. I'm not getting everything right, and I'm glad about that. 
So, this is Champions of Champions Boxing Talk. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you all soon.